below their marginal cost, uh, shouldn't this attract competitors to enter the market? And this is a very classical idea in economics, is that in the long run, if people can enter the market freely, uh, firms shouldn't earn any profits, because any profits would attract competitors to enter the market. Um, the idea is that only the short-term advantages, only if prices are only rising for a short term, and therefore people don't have time to get into the market, will someone will be able to earn a profit. In the long term, they won't be able to. So an example of this was the California gold rush, right? So the first people who found gold in California, and a couple people who were like living near California, made a bunch of money. But quickly, everybody rushed into the state, and most of the people who came, you know, even a year in, didn't do any better than they would have done staying on the East Coast, right? Because it was very easy to come to California, and they eroded all the profits. Um, another example of that is, you know, Groupon got into the market for doing their thing early, but a ton of people copied them almost immediately, right? Um, and you know, if one firm is doing something more efficiently than other firms, other firms will just switch to doing it the way that firm was doing. So think about Apple. You know, all the smartphones before Apple were these stinky BlackBerry type things, right? And then Apple brought in this uh, touchscreen technology, and within a year, like 95% of all smartphones were using touchscreen technology, right? Um, and on the other hand, anytime a firm is making a loss, anytime it's uh, not doing a very good job, it should exit the market. Now, um, there was an article in The Onion that I really enjoyed, uh, which said that a fundamental challenge to this classical economic theory was the continued existence of edible arrangements. I don't know if anyone has uh, ever uh, had the joy of receiving an edible arrangement, but they're about the most pointless <laughs> thing on earth, because the fruit... Uh, do, do people know what this is, actually? They're like these like uh, flower, uh, flowers made out of fruit. And like the fruit is of terrible quality, right? Because it has to be like carved up to make this crappy arrangement. It doesn't look like, I mean, it's like the stupidest thing ever, right? So, so the idea was, it did an interview with a whole bunch of economists saying that it was a fundamental challenge to the notion that a firm that's you know, underperforming has to exit the market, that edible arrangements continues to exist. Which I kind of agree with. Actually, if you want to go see edible arrangements and you haven't, there's one at 51st uh, and the train tracks, basically, in Harper. Um, so the, this theory would imply that the long-run supply function of the industry should be just flat at the minimum of the average cost curve. That's the cheapest way that you can produce, <coughs> and uh, the long-run supply should just be that everybody produces at that price. Um, and the average cost curve here is defined over all possible technologies that could exist. Um, okay, so, however, um, the long run average cost curve will not be quite flat, uh, even in the long run, even under this model. Um, Max, could you tell us why the long run cost, even in, under free entry, uh, won't be quite flat? Um, it, uh, the number of firms are quite small. Yeah. So if there's not that many firms, that's exactly right. So why, why does that keep going, Max? Why, why, why does that make it not quite flat? Um, because there's, uh, there's, when the, the number of firms are not quite small, it creates, well, let's say if you had a large number of firms, yeah. it would create more of a, Stable. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah. Um, and a small number of firms is more variation, more things that can happen. Yeah. So basically, if the, if the number of firms are small, then when entry occurs, it causes the amount that the firms are producing per firm to fall by a significant amount. And therefore, in order to get a new firm to enter, you can't just like be at exactly the minimum of the average cost curve. You need to go slightly up it, and then there's enough for a new firm to enter so that you go slightly below the minimum. So you sort of, there's sort of like this minimum of the average cost, and you sort of seesaw between being slightly above it and being slightly below it, rather than staying exactly at the minimum point. If there were a very large number of firms, then you could stay at exactly the minimum point. But because there's not, you have to go slightly above or slightly below. 
This is usually called the integer problem. Um, but as the number of firms grow, <coughs> the amount that you have to seesaw between gets smaller and smaller. Right? Um, and so this gives you an example of this. If there, here's the supply curve of one firm. If a second firm enters, then you have a supply curve like this. If a third firm enters, you get a supply curve like that. And eventually, these are going to converge to this minimum point, the minimum of the average cost curve, which is right here. But it doesn't, it doesn't get quite there until the number of firms gets pretty large. Um, however, again, if we have a small number of firms, this is not very consistent with the assumption of price taken. Yeah, um, and so this integer problem that we're talking about, that you know, it makes a discrete difference that a new firm enters, and so it can't be quite at the minimum, is really relevant more in models where firms have market power than in a perfectly competitive model. So this just gives you a picture from Varian of what happens. So initially they get that, but then they get flatter and flatter and flatter, and as the number of firms gets large, as the market is large relative to any individual firm, it approaches this uh, approximate long-run supply curve, which is the minimum of the average cost curve. Okay. So, um, <coughs> the um, process of competition, of course, can be inhibited if there are some barriers to entering the industry. And a lot of these barriers come out of government policy. Um, so, um, um, government intervention <coughs> can, can cause uh, a barrier to entry, or private violence can cause a barrier to entry. Um, and uh, uh, Federico, can you give me some examples of um, some various countries? So one really good one that was in the book is uh, licenses for taxis. Yeah. There's also licenses for liquor. And then in one, then there's also like uh, government um, laws, like for example, the rights to construct a railway in a certain states. Yeah. Absolutely. So government can sort of like legislate people out of the industry by licensing them in various ways or by restricting people from entering the industry. Doctors have to be licensed, as we discussed in the first lecture. Taxi drivers get licenses. There can be regulatory barriers or like, you know, things that you have to do, things, rules you have to comply with to get into an industry. Private violence can make a big difference as well. So the Mexican cartels maintain their monopoly over the drug trade by killing off people who try to enter the industry, right? And the mafia does that in many industries as well. Another thing that can happen is, you know, minority-owned businesses often have a hard time entering the market um, <coughs> because they get treated poorly by people, they get harassed. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan can intimidate them, especially in the 1950s that used to happen. Um, Another thing that can happen, which is more subtle, is that a dominant firm in, <coughs> in an industry can make contractual agreements that try to exclude people from entering the market. So, um, I, when I was in Peru this summer, uh, the government I was working with the government related to a case where, um, so basically in Peru, there's one company that controls 98% of the beer market. Mm -hmm. And um, what they do is they went to, um, on the beach, there's these little shacks that sell beer. And they went to every single shack that sells beer along the beach in all of Peru, and they said, you can either carry our beer, which everybody knows, or you can car carry any other type of beer. And so basically they said, if you want to have our beer, you have to exclude all other types of beer. And that basically made it impossible for anyone to enter the market because A, um, all the other beer companies, uh, sorry, 40% of all beer is sold on the beach. And second of all, you know, people, like, when they think of having a good time, they think of what they do on the beach, right? So if you can't get access to the beach, it's very hard for you to break into the rest of the market. So that's another example. Um, usually, these types of things are uh, created by lobbying the government or uh, by some form of violence. And economists call these activities, trying to keep competitors out of the market, rent-seeking. Because you're trying to create a rent for yourself, uh, a profit for yourself, by keeping other people out of competing with you. And we usually view these as negative things uh, for three 
basic reasons. And is Edward here? I don't think he is. Edward Watt? No. Well, so the, the three reasons why economists usually view these as bad are that the effort expended to try to get these, the money spent lobbying the government, the money spent hiring enforcers to go out and kill people, or the actual act of killing people, uh, is very socially wasteful. And so that means that the profits that you earn uh, aren't just a transfer to you from the consumers, but actually get a lot of those get, end up getting wasted uh, on the effort to try to gain that profit. Second, they usually benefit some favored group who's usually not the person that society wants to help the most. They don't tend to usually be like the poorest people or the people most in need of help. They tend to be the people who are sort of most enterprising to figure out a way to steal. And third, um, they require the inefficient restriction of supply. And so even if you did want to give money to those people, it would be better just to give them money directly rather than to um, rather than to restrict the production of a product uh, and therefore reduce uh, its supply in order to uh, transfer money to those people. Now, um, the, <coughs> the first reason that I said above, <coughs> the, the, our concern that you know, the effort expended <coughs> in order to create the um, protection is a waste, is one of the most important reasons why we don't like these types of barriers to entry. And the way to see that is that the government actually creates, and a lot of people support creating, barriers to entry um, which encourage good activity. So intellectual property is the most uh, prominent example of that. Patents, <coughs> copyrights, trademarks prevent people from competing with the person who has that right. And the problem is that without that, free entry would drive the profits that the firm would make to zero, and then no one would have an incentive to try to create new products, to invest in developing new drugs, to create new software, uh, and so forth. Um, and this will be the focus of what we'll talk about in lecture 13. But the key thing to remember is that what makes a barrier to entry good or bad is where the profits that it creates go. Yes, Steve. Um, I've uh, read a, a couple of things that say that uh, software patents are kind of a bad thing for innovation because uh, code can be so similar in, in a lot of different ways that um, it, it kind of drives out innovation and it creates like a stagnation. Is, is, what do you think of that? Is there any validity to that argument? Sure. So, I mean, there, there's real trade-offs in these things, right? Because as I showed on the previous slide, even if it's incentivizing good things, it's still going to lead some people to get you know, rents that we, maybe they don't deserve, and it's also going to require the inefficient restriction of the production of other things like other software. Uh, so there's definitely um, costs associated with intellectual property, and there's a real trade-off there. And in lecture 13, we're going to look exactly at that trade-off between the sort of costs you're saying uh, like, you know, the discouragement of future innovation and the benefits associated with encouraging people to make the, those investments. So that, that's a really important trade-off. Yeah, ben. But on that same notion, like, as you said, like, if you're doing it better, it doesn't matter if you have a patent or not, right? Like, it, nobody cares if someone created, like, you use Facebook because it's better than MySpace, whether, like, MySpace is this, like, like it serves the same essential function, right? Like, we think Facebook is better, so we use it, or, like, People don't care that like how similar the Samsung tablet is to the iPad. Like the iPad is better, so it's used more. Well, but I mean, so like Apple is protected by a lot of patents. Sure, sure. But I mean, the thing is that if someone, and, and actually this does happen in Peru. There, you can literally get an iPod that's not made by Apple because they basically have no patent protection. And so, people do not buy iPods in Peru. People buy the imitation iPods because you can literally get something Mine that's is, exactly yeah. the same as the. Apple. They're, I mean, they're basically the same thing. Because the thing is that these other companies can copy some things that Apple do, but they can't do the exact same thing. And if you can do exact